all for advocating memorizing things just for the sake of memorizing them, but when it comes to amino acids, there's some things you should really know. This starts with the three letter amino acid like nickname as well as this one letter like initial. So for alanine say, this would be ALA and A. Makes sense, right? Well, then you get to things like glutamine where you're looking at GLN and Q. So let's talk about um, how we can help remember these amino acids as well as why it's important to really uh, know, to at least know these codes and some basic things about the amino acids. When you see that code, you should be able to think, oh, that one's that and that has this properties. So let's go. So if you were to say, look at a protein in Uniprot, which is this database of all like the protein sequences and stuff. Um, if you were to look at its sequence, you can see that it's using this one letter code. Similarly, I can look in PyMo where we can see the structure and you can see that the sequence is displayed in this nice one letter code. It makes it fairly compact, even though it's over 800 amino acids. If I were to go to display sequence mode residue names and now put the three letter codes, those like nicknames, well now you can see that it takes a lot more space and it's harder to see what's near what. So enter those one letter codes, but that actually isn't exactly where the one letter codes came from. They came more from um, being used to store um, for like the data storage aspects. And for this, we have to thank um, Dr. Margaret Oakley Dayhoff. This is a really great um, website article that I found um, from the biology project. Um, and so basically she was considered like one of the founders of bioinformatics. And she created this shortened code to shortening these three letters to one letters to reduce the size of the data files um, that would be needed um, to handle this data. Um, and so we have her to thank. And so how did you come up with some of these random ones? They're not actually as random as you might think. So let's take a look. So there are 20 um, common genetically encoded proteinogenic amino acids. Um, and our alphabet has 26 letters. So most of the letters will be used, um, but not all of them. But some of these start with the amino acids start with the same letter or even the same several letters. So for the ones where they're the only one that start with that letter, um, they're gonna have that first letter. So for example, proline is the only one that starts with a P, cool, you get the P. Um, Histidine is the only one that starts with an H, you get the H. For the ones where there is um, like multiple that start with it, now it goes to the one that occurs most frequently in a protein, in proteins typically. So tyrosine and threonine, threonine occurs more commonly. So threonine gets the T and tyrosine gets the Y because the Y is like the second letter here. But it's not always the second letter that you use if something, um, if there is this like conflict between um, multiple. So for lysine and leucine, for lysine, you have um, a K, and for leucine, you have an L. So K might seem kind of weird, but tyrosine got that Y and K is close to L. Um, and you can't go, nothing was using K. Um, if you go to M, then methionine's using that. So yeah, K, lysine, is one of those really weird ones. Okay, let's just go like one by one. Okay, glycine, that's simple. You get that G, you're like more common than glutamine or glutamate. Um, and you get GLY because that's not a confusion. So for most of these, the first three letters are gonna be the first three letters. Um, the only ones that aren't are when it comes to asparagine and glutamine. So these two are going to end in an N. So asparagine, you get that, put the N on the end of asparagine of the AS. Glutamine, you put the N on the end of the GL because you can't use ASP because aspartate got that. You can't use GLU because glutamate got that. And so you are left with this ASN and GLN. Okay. So these also, these ones also have some weirdness because so asparagine, it gets an N because like asparagine. But then you have the problem, well, what about why doesn't glutamine get that N? Well, glutamine is gonna get a Q. So you can think like glutamine, like it's a glue Q, but don't just think glue Q because, well, glue is glutamate. So it gets that GLU and it's got the abbreviation E. Aspartate, um, it has ASP, 
um, and it gets a D. So you have D and you have E. And so D, aspartate starts with a D um, because D is lower in the alphabet than glutamate, which gets the E. So basically they look for letters that weren't being used already. D and E weren't being used. A is, D is closer to A, E is closer to G, voila. You can also remember that aspartate is shorter and this has the, um, so it gets the earlier letter in the alphabet and the longer one has the later letter in the alphabet. Um, you can also remember aspartate, like you can think aspartate and then you can think of that D. Um, and then you just have to remember that the other one is E. Um, okay, so those are the weird ones. So isoleucine, yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly sure why it's I-S-I-L-E instead of like I-S-O. Um, but it's ILE, so remember that one, but it does get the I, which is like normal. Um, okay, most of these are normal. When we go to these aromatic ones, now things start getting weird again. Um, so tryptophan, so basically it's um, TRP. So sometimes in like some early papers, especially you might see it labeled TRY. Um, and so, be careful when you see that, that it might not actually um, be the, like it, they might be talking about tryptophan. I'm guessing they just changed it because like try, like you don't want people thinking you're just like saying try, but I don't know that for sure. So don't take my word for that. I'm just guessing. Okay, but tryptophan, so you get TRP, um, so like trip, um, and then a W. Um, so you can think tryptophan, like that helps me remember, like think of it as like, Tweety Bird's favorite amino acid is tryptophan. So like it's the W. You can also remember that it has these like two rings that kind of look like you're making a W. Okay, um, so phenylalanine, this one, um, PHE, so that part's normal. And it gets an F. Um, so like phenylalanine, um, so pha, 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 phenyl. Um, so you can remember the F that way. Um, then we already talked about tyrosine, how it gets that T-Y-R, but because threonine got that T, tyrosine gets that Y, so tyrosine. Okay, um, going back to these guys. Um, so we talked about lysine, how it has that weird K, at least the L-Y-S, that part's normal. Um, arginine, it gets the ARG um, and R, because arginine and alanine stole the A. Histidine, um, here, this one is normal, this and H. Okay, I think that those are the main things. So this, um, this terminology is really useful because especially like, so we saw how it could save space. We also use it as kind of like shorthand when we're talking about amino acid substitutions. So like mutations in the protein. Um, so some people get all um, like technical about like mutations are in the DNA, but we talk about mutations being in proteins too. Um, so when you get this like amino acid substitution, we typically write it if, it, so say if you went from a glycine to an alanine, you would write G91A. So the thing was before and then the thing it was after. And it's really important because these types of substitutions can have dramatic effects. So we see this with like sickle cell disease where you have this single letter mutation. Um, so you go from an E to a V. And if you were to remember, oh, E is glutamate and V is valine, and you were to remember that glutamate is this negatively charged, it's this hydrophilic, so water loves to hang out with it. And then you're substituting it for this thing that's like hydrophobic, so water doesn't like to hang out with it. And then you can see that, okay, well, adding that change there is going to change the protein, make it clump together and um, form these long sickle, um, these sickle cells that like link up and cause problems. So by recognizing these letters and recognizing the basic properties of the amino acids that go with those letters, then you're able to like figure out things or guess about what things might cause. You might also hear these substitution terms um, talked a lot about in the context of say, like spike protein variants in the coronavirus spike protein. Um, and so sometimes you might be able to say, okay, well, that, that's a big change or that doesn't seem like that big of a change. We can talk about like some changes that are like conservative if they're going from ones that are similar versus like more dramatic changes um, and from like charge to nonpolar and that sort of thing.
So some of the things you should be able to recognize from the amino acid. So in addition to being able to recognize the names, I suggest that you at least be able to recognize the structures when you see them. So build up to being able to like draw them free. And if you're, if you have to like learn them for school or whatever, then definitely um, memorize this, being able to draw the structures. But you should at least be able to, in your mind, like connect the, connect the letters and connect like those nicknames to the properties of the amino acid. And you should be able to look at an amino acid and be able to say the name um, and be able to look at an amino acid and see how its structure might give it certain properties. But in terms of those names, so name and then the make like a key thing about it. So you should be able to characterize the proteins. So, okay, are they nonpolar? Are they gonna be typically hidden from water in like the center of a protein because the water like excludes them and squishes them all together? Or is it, so are they gonna be hydrophobic or are they going to be polar so, or charged where the water is gonna want to hang out with them? You'll find these on the surface of proteins. Be able to recognize which amino acids are often going to be negatively charged. So this is going to be your aspartate and your glutamate. You might sometimes see them as aspartic acid and glutamic acid. In that case, they would have the um, carboxylic acid group. So this would be protonated, but typically they're in this deprotonated state. And so we call them aspartate and glutamate. Um, Okay, that the ones that are sometimes charged, lysine, arginine, histidine. So being able to recognize when you hear these D or an E, oh, that's one of those ones that's probably negatively charged. Here are K, R, or H. Oh, that's one of those basic ones that's, base, that's typically positively charged. Um, some other things. So know which ones, if you hear like a V or an L or an I, like, oh, that's a nonpolar one. That's probably hydrophobic. If you um, be able to know which ones have the um, have this carboxylic acid group, so those are gonna be the same ones that are the charge. Know which ones um, have an OH group, so have this hydroxyl group. These are going to be able to be phosphorylated. So when we talk about like serine and threonine and tyrosine, recognize that those might be able to be phosphorylated. Also be able to know which ones are aromatic. So they have these ring structures. Um, with this like electron shared resonance between them. Um, these are also going to have typically the property of absorbing UV light, especially tryptophan. Um, so if a protein has a lot of tryptophan, that is going to make it absorb more. If you don't see any tryptophans in your protein, well, that's gonna cause problems when you try to use UV to visualize it. Um, some other things, know which ones have sulfur. So our sulfur sisters, methionine and cysteine, know that those two have sulfur. Um, they have different properties though. So methionine is used to methylate things often and cysteine can form these crosslinks. Know which ones are nucleophilic. Um, so these can often, in addition to getting like phosphorylated, there are other modifications. So serine, threonine, tyrosine, cysteine, lysine, lysine and histidine, these can often be uh, more reactive. Um, okay, a couple final things. Know that, know which ones have those weird structural things about them. So when we talk about like um, glycine and proline, so glycine is really small, it's just got this hydrogen and proline is this weird bulky thing. So you have to also remember which ones are like bulky. So in addition to having these bulky like aromatic ones, leucine and ice, or especially like isoleucine and valine, they have their bulk close to their backbone. This matters because the backbone, the bigger the bulk, the, the closer the bulk is to the backbone, the harder it is to the backbone to rotate. Um, well, I mean like the backbone, the peptide bond doesn't but rotate, but you rotate around like on either side of it. And this allows the protein to take distinct angles that give it, it's like allow it to take the secondary structure of those things like helices and strands and sheets and all this good stuff. Um, if you have your bolt closer, that makes it harder to move. And so, and with, especially with proline, it's got a really restricted range of motion because it kind of like folds up on itself. Whereas glycine, um, it's got this small, loosey goosey flexible, so it can be a lot of different places. So if you were to say change a glycine to a proline, then you can limit, you can kind of lock in place the structure better. Um, and so for some like recombinant protein constructs and stuff for like the spike protein, they can actually make it with a, um, with proline substitutions. Um, 
not, I don't remember what it was substituted from, but to proline to kind of like lock it in a particular state that makes it better for our immune system recognizing um, for the vaccines and for structural studies. Okay, and yeah, so I think that that is basically it. Um, so remember those three letter codes, remember the one letter codes, remember the weirdos. Um, and be able to know basic when you see or see it, think the name. When you see the name, think the properties. Um, and yeah. Oh, another thing is that when it comes to like a spare gene and glutamate for structure wise, like the glutamine G is later in the alphabet. It also has, it's also longer. So um, you, for like aspartate and glutamate, the same holds. Um, so these are just like the amide and the carboxyl for carboxyl versions. Um, and so like aspartate is before glutamate, aspartate is shorter than glutamate. Aspartate also gets the D and glutamate gets the E. Um, and the same with the N and Q, but that's less obvious. Um, but yeah, so hope that helps and just some key things to keep in mind when you are learning about amino acids.